Hello everyone and welcome to talk on how to onboard a student, how to onboard students to your project and find a project intern. My name is Dr. Spishovic Kula and this is my dear colleague Martin Radio. So, I would like to start with a little bit of an introduction where it all started. So me and Martin, what you already need to know about us is that we both studied at the university in <coughs> Brno. Me at Mendel University and Martin at Mosaic University and unfortunately we failed this one too. <laughs> so at some point we had broad experience with university teaching and so on. Then I, once upon a time I was in the University of Helsinki and there was this subject called software factory and it was nothing like subjects we had because the main objective was to provide a pro-life experience in the academic environment. So the students worked on a project that was introduced by someone from the industry. The classroom didn't look like this one. It had workstations like we had an office, and it had like this white board where you had to like come down with things to do, things in progress, and so on. And they also had like coffee machine just for themselves and couch, couch with a PlayStation to relax. So it really was amazing. They also had like meetings like stand-ups, demos and planning. And yeah, it sounded really fun at the time. I know that everyone likes meetings nowadays. So I didn't make the cut for this subject. And I was devastated. I really wanted to, but I was not sure. Then I returned from Erasmus and I passed my oral exam at Super Engineering 1 and 2. And the teacher just asked me, like, how was your Erasmus? So I told him about the software factory. And he told me, yeah, it would be amazing to have something like that here. Like that. Okay. Then I graduated. John Redhead and talked with Martin about our experience, experiences at university and what we actually liked, what we were missing there. John, the mic. Where is John? I'm so sorry. <laughs> so, uh, we were talking about lacking open source. We didn't use it, we didn't contribute to it, we barely knew there was some licensing, like no open source at all at the university at the time. There was also limited scope of home projects, like every project we had to start from the scratch, we had to write tons of new code that we are never ever gonna use again, and so on. I really <laughs> did hate that. And there was also limited collaboration. Yes, we did have team projects, but from my honest experience, it was that either I did all the work or someone from the team did all the work and I did nothing. So collaboration was also not really there. So that was that. And then there was lack of refactoring. And this, is, was like, this was like the hugest thing for me because I'm the person who hates greenfield projects. Like, I don't want to start from scratch with new shiny technologies. I do hate that. I love old code bases that you have to go through and refactor it to something newer, find the bugs, read tons and tons of lines of code and find that one where there's like this small bug that happens every full moon. So the lack of refactoring at the university almost meant for me to stop programming because I couldn't imagine that for the rest of my life I will be writing new projects over and over and over again. But fortunately, my friend Martin told me, yeah, work-life experience is different from University, so don't worry, join us, you will see. And I did. And then there was limited knowledge of developer tools. I don't know if you managed to 
fail with one of them like spectacularly like I did. Before Red Hat, I was working at this small company and we were using Git, but I was the only one working on the project, so I was using it like really basically. And I was uplo uploading only the modified files, not the new ones, because I didn't know, know better. So I worked on that, worked, 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 and then I left for two weeks on holiday. And someone was supposed to take over after me. And yeah, they were missing all the new files I didn't upload. And <laughs> yeah, I had to, for my holiday, to zip everything I had, send, upload it on like this sharing server they had to download it. Yeah, that was tragic. And I would have loved to have this experience in academic environment when they only meant it that I failed a class, not that my boss was screaming at me and yeah. <laughs> so that was also one of the motivation for to start something, to provide advanced knowledge of developer tools that you need. And then there was the other side, the working side, when we were working on Manage IQ. I don't know if anyone knows it. Anyone who didn't work on it, no, if it knows, does, yeah, don't worry about it. Neither did the interns who were like joining Red Hat, which was a problem because they were like trying to get to RHEL, OpenStack, OpenShift. No one was interested in our project, so we really struggled to get good interns to join us. Next slide, please. So we came up with the solution. Let's do software factory on our Manage IQ project. And let's introduce Manage IQ. It's infra cloud VM management platform. That's not interesting part. But the code base is huge and like amazing lesson in history. Because the UI was written in Ruby on Rails. There was some jQuery. There was some Angular 1 when everyone else was using Angular 4. And there was too many opportunities to improve it, refactor it, debug it, whatever, because there was like more than 150 forms. So there was plenty of work. So after we came with this idea, we started to prepare for it. Well, normally you would have like this dilemma if you first you ask the school or the, your management. We knew where to go for like school. So we went to our managers trying to convince them and they were like, yeah, we are Red Hat, we do that. No worries, no need to convince us. So that was easy. And then we went back to teachers and there was a little bit of problem because we had to compromise on how it's gonna go. We really wanted to like do everything, but they were like, yeah, but we have like this syllabus and we really insist on doing workflow charts in the first class and the next one they can work on the project. So we, have to, we had to compromise there. And when this is, was, all was, was set, we also reached back to the professor from the software factory. He gave us, our, gave us some tips and one of them was to really sell it to the students, show them around Red Hat and also send them an email when we explain everything and like excite them to join. So we write this email when we, uh, when there was all the information, how it's gonna go, why we are doing that, who we are and so on. And at the first year we had like 13 students who volunteered to go for this cla class group. Next slide please. So we had the basic preparation done and then we needed to set everything up. First thing we really needed to think through were the issues that the students gonna be working on. And it kind of sounds easy, but it wasn't because at the first you really have to make sure that you have kind of same is issues for everyone. You really don't want to explain different things to different students. So first thing is li really looking into issues that are repeating over and over and over again. Well, if you have 150 forms, they really do. Then you have to think about how big the task has to be. 
you don't want to do something that's too easy, but on the other side, you really want to make sure there's enough time to finish it and to merge the code. So we decided to go for easier task, and if there was too much time, we can do two or three instead of one huge, when we could risk, risk that students didn't finish and the PR stayed there, like work in progress. So, and other thing is that it should be something that's easy to onboard the students to, like they should, shouldn't have to look at some random file that's super special somewhere deep and you have to do too much stuff to get there in the UI also. From our experience, we would recommend looking into UXD issues like unifying how the buttons look, the names of them, positions, order of the buttons, and so on. There's always refactoring, like we were trying to go from Angular 1 to 4, and there was too many steps to do, so that was good. There's also uh, tests, because there's never enough tests. Like, I don't know if anyone worked on a project that had too many tests and no one wanted to write anymore. So tests are also good. And then there's tech depth, like you can look for depth methods or something like that. Then you have to prepare every, like the information side of the things. You probably have some documentation to your project, but it can be outdated or not easy to understand and so on, so it's good to go and rev revisit it if it's easy to run your project from, the documenta from just reading the documentation and you know what to do and so on. Uh, we also had this uh, for the Manage IQ. From time to time it happened that you get this error that happened kind of often and you needed to do like this command or that command to fix it. So it's good to document those two. Like if your webpack is failing, it's probably because you need to remove node modules and npm install everything again. Then you need to prepare the issues. You probably have your own issue tracker and if your manager is allowing you to use it with students, amazing, it's done. But if not, you need to find some good issue tracker, import all those issues they are gonna work on maybe write more information because they are going to be new and they need more details on it and so on and then there's communication channel uh, we were offered that yeah you can write the uh, emails to the students or we will or the teachers will write to them but i believe it's better to have something like slack or gitter where you can communicate where everyone sees everything so it's not getting lost or forgotten or just one student know that he's not supposed to come because he asked if we are going to have it, have the class on public holiday. So it's really good and also students will try to, well, also students will tell you that things like, yeah, my PR is done and no one will look at it in two weeks. Do something about it. So it's good to have like direct communication channel, like a chat room. Yeah, that's it for me, and I will let Martin explain the technical problems and so on. All right, uh, can everyone hear me? Great. Uh, all right, so uh, when we kind of thought that we had everything prepared. We went to the university and started getting like the classroom ready and all that. And like, we didn't go as far as software factory. We didn't buy a coffee machine, but we did make sure that the students had a classroom available that was available to them all the time. And that the computers there had the project pre-installed so that they could just log in and start working on it. It was a bit of a challenge because those were Windows machines and our project was really not ready for Windows. So we ended up setting up some VMs and basically uploading VMs to all those machines 
and letting the students download it for their own notebooks so that they could run it locally as well. Uh, so that was a bit of a challenge, but <laughs> fun. Uh, and then we kind of like started the actual course. Uh, as Zita said, we first invited the students to Red Hat, you know, show them around, tell them what it's going to be about. But like when we actually started, one of the first things we kind of tried to stress was that like every one of everyone should get their GitHub account, preferably something with a name that you won't be ashamed of later. Because like 10 years ago when I joined Red Hat, I joined because like some random recruiter reached out to me and it was all based on my GitHub profile. So like we kind of felt like we need to stress the importance of like if you have this, it might be easier. It's like, you know, it gives you an edge. So, uh, yeah, we make sure we, we made sure that they, they all had GitHub profiles and could like work with that. So, like one of the first lessons was about how to create a PR properly. You know, writing descriptions that actually say what you're well trying to do as opposed to what the code says. Uh, you know, if it's like UI thing, adding screenshots before and after. You know, things like that. Yeah, so that they could be like good citizens. <laughs> uh, and yeah, the other thing that we kind of needed, needed to stress is that uh, like collaboration is not a bad word. It sometimes is in university, but not in the real life. So we encourage our students to like talk, talk to us on the chat, talk to each other. We made sure that they were reviewing PRs uh, from each other so that they could learn. Like one of them did something silly and will remember it forever. But they can also like check other students' code, and if they made the same mistake, they can kind of help them, you know, fix that. Or they could learn something new from the other students who did things differently. So, yeah, even if like it may feel trivial, it's really important for them to like read each other's code and all that. And then we kind of started the first first year course, and kind of soon we identified a couple of problems. One of them was that like nobody was really familiar with Git or really using CLI in practice. And like everybody could commit to master and push it to their repository, but they weren't used to working together. So things like rebasing, pulling changes from the server, even the concept of Git remotes and even branches really. So we kind of I had to backtrack a bit and focus on Git and really like tell, show them how it works, how branching is done, uh, how not to panic when you lose the commit you are working on because you can still find it and things like that. So yeah, we kind of pivoted to teaching Git in the beginning and then kind of went back. The other, the other thing that we kind of underestimated at first is the time availability. In if, if you know that you're gonna have 10 lessons, that's a lie. Because like one time the electricity was not working. The other time there was an unrelated exam in the same room. The other time there was a public holiday that we kind of didn't know about. Uh, so yeah, like expect the unexpected. You have to be flexible, you will have to adapt. But yeah, it's doable. <laughs> and so what we actually did uh, we taught this course for two years. It was like uh, software engineering one and software engineering two in like consecutive semesters and then repeat it again. In the first year we had 13 students. It was like a select well, volunteer group and all the other groups were like the default ones. And yeah, in, in the first year we kind of started with uh, some flow diagrams and all that, mostly because it was in the subject syllabus and we kind of had to stick to that. And then we moved on to like some basic refactoring tasks. And yeah, the other, the other year we kind of expanded the effort. We had two groups of 20 people and we roped in two of our colleagues so that they would join us and like teach the other, teach the other group. Uh, now, what we what they actually did uh, with the like 
the first the first task that they got uh, had to be really easy because like think think from the point of view of the student. They're seeing an unknown project for the first time. They're dealing with Git the first time. They're dealing with GitHub the first time. They're collaborating with each other the first time. So the actual task has to be really trivial because they're going to get stuck in unrelated things. And they don't, you don't want the students to get frustrated right away because the, the task was too huge. They can always have more tasks, but really start easy, start really easy. Uh, once, once that was right, settled, everybody was feeling confident about contributing, you know, about opening PRs and stuff like that. We moved on to a bit harder tasks. Uh, yeah, uh, the, the the first task, first task that they really did was like remove a share, remove a method that was like copied all over the place and replace it with a Ruby Vixen. So really just like deleting a method and including that includes that adds it back from a shared code base. Uh, the second task was uh, converting some AngularJS forms to a slightly newer version of AngularJS. So we kind of went went through like what all the changes uh, are and what they would mean in in, in the group in, in the classroom, and then the students had like homework to try to do it for themselves uh, all in our code base. Uh, the second year, uh, uh, there was a backend group who was writing tests. And our group was looking at uh, removing that code. So we kind of looked at some static analyzer tool that identified that methods. But it was like, it had lots of false positives. So the task was really just like take take a bunch of methods that the tool reports as that and try to remove them and see if they're really dead or if that's like false positive. It was a task like that. And then we focused on refactoring forms again, this time a bit like larger. I think the students were converting from like Ruby HTML static forms to Angular dynamic forms. Uh, now, I it, it was definitely a success because like by the time the semester ended, we pretty much knew all the students were attending, and we could kind of reach out to the best ones and offer them internship. So each of those years, we got a really high quality intern from that effort. Uh, in fact, one of them is still at Red Hat and got promoted to principal software engineering before us. So yeah, that's a success. <laughs> and obviously, if you like want to do something like this, expect that the time commitment is quite high. It took us about two weeks to prepare everything. Then we had to like attend all the classes, obviously, and prepare for them. Then there's the time in PR review. Although, yeah, this one, I would recommend having a team that's like large enough that your colleagues can help out. Because like if, 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 it, if it were just, two, just the two of us, we would get lost in PR reviews. Fortunately, we had a team that worked with us and really helped out the students as well. So, yeah. What was the next slide? Oh, that's it. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, it, it, I think it was really a success. I, we would do it again given the right conditions. And thank you. Any questions? <laughs> David? I'll repeat the question. Yeah. So the question is that uh, ManageIQ was like a large monolithic application, that, but basically like it was a monolith. You had to run one script to set it up and one script to actually run it. Uh, the question is that now with the modern architectures where you have like multiple moving parts, 
would it be that as easy? I think that it all boils down to documentation, really. Like, if, if you have project documentation that's good enough to onboard new people, you have project documentation that's good enough to onboard new students, assuming you explain all the bits that you would like assume are obvious for your colleagues. And you know, more often than not, it really helps to like show something like that to students because they can actually point out, yeah, that part doesn't make sense. Expand on this one. You know, if you tell students to install Postgres, some of them will be fully capable of doing that. Others will tell you, hey, maybe add some more instructions here. You know, that that can be helpful for your documentation as well. And yeah, like I agree that it's more complicated, but I mean. Our current project, we're working on Ansible Galaxy now, or I am. Uh, we still have a script to run the whole thing. I, I, it's an unholy thing that runs a make file that spawns Docker and spawns multiple Docker containers. So yeah, the environment is definitely more complicated now. But I think you can kind of shield the students from that a bit. I would like to add that just before we started that, the manage IQ was like one repo. And before we started, it started to like split into multiple repos. And yeah, we just had to run two. But it did make us li our life harder because of that. So. University, there was multiple like companies who went there and did that just like two-hour presentation, but and the and they like encouraged the students to go and join them, but nothing of this scope. consider the use of LLMs for like generating documentation and preparing stuff. Uh, well, our answer is no, we didn't because uh, it did, this was like a few years ago. So it was before, before the LLM boom that just wasn't relevant back then. Now it might be interesting, but I would kind of stress that you need someone to check the documentation that was generated because you don't want to add confusion. Uh, the question is, where the students paid? Uh, not, not with money. We, we, oh yeah, uh, GitHub does some academia outreach program where if you're teaching something Git related, you can order some swag from GitHub. So we kind of try to bribe our students that way. But I think the main, like, the main benefit for them was the experience and like, having some open source contribution to some project on GitHub. That was very good.
question was uh, whether it would make sense uh, to like have something like company wide that prepares the, student, the newly hired interns and kind of teaches them all those like skills that might be missing from the university. And I think the first question was uh, like whether it would make sense to engage with the universities to yeah, to make sure that those things are thought. Uh, well, we definitely had some discussions about that with our like with the uh, teachers that we were like involved with at school. And yeah, I absolutely agree that, that this would be something that would be useful. And like my impression is that the universities are kind of edging towards like teaching these things as well these days. Uh, but yeah, I think it's a slow process. And like part of part of the problem might be that like at least here it takes a few years to approve any changes to the syllabus. So if you actually want to teach something new, you you have you have bar bureaucratic hurdles. So yeah, this might actually be easier to do in company, but I think universities you know, are getting better. conference that was aimed at university professors about teaching and I remember this young professor who was telling us yeah like it took us five years to convince our colleagues to go from Pascal to Java so yeah I mean I, I believe they are trying but it takes more time